thank you. Good evening, everybody. Ask me what my identity is, and you will receive a multifaceted answer. I am a Palestinian, I am an Arab, I am an, a woman, I am a citizen of Israel, I am a member of the minority, a native of this land, my homeland. And I was for 12 years an immigrant in Denmark, until a year ago I decided to return. I came back to take a leading role in the effort to promote equality for the Arab citizens of Israel and build with our fellow Jewish citizens a shared society. Being Arab is about speaking Arabic, a language that despite its official status in Israel has been pushed to a small corner. Not only for me, but also for the Jews who have immigrated from Arab-speaking countries. Arabic is marked as the language of the enemy. It's studied in the Jewish sector as part of the preparation for an IDF service in the, ex ex in the intelligence forces. Its existence in the public sphere is a constant struggle raised by, erased by vandalism, marginalized and hidden by the authorities. Being Arab also means being part of the Arab world. But growing up in Israel, this was a challenge. The sources of information about the Arab world in a pre-internet uh, era were very limited and controlled by the state. Israeli radio in Arabic called Israel Baravit and Friday afternoon Egyptian movies. At school, we studied about the Arab world, but through the eyes of the Jewish Israelis, where Arab countries are perceived as our enemies, defeated time and time again at wars. The message that came across, across that was, this is not an identity worth having. I am a part of the largest minority in Israel, nearly 20% of the citizens. We, the Arab citizens of Israel, are not only a minority. We are a minority that has been discriminated and that, and that too is part of who I am. I grew up in a village of Kalansawa, only 16 kilometers from Netanya. I remember that even as a child, I began noticing the gaps, the dirty streets in Kalansawa, the lack of infrastructure and services compared to Netanya, which was clean and modern and had all the facilities. In retrospect, I know that these memories have had an impact on my professional choices, working for social change and advocating for closing the gaps between the Arab society and the Jewish one. I am a Palestinian. I am a part of the Palestinian people. We lived here prior to 1948, and my family had closest ties with Dul Karim. In fact, I still have relatives there today, only five kilometers away from Kalansawa. The border that was put in place after the 1948 war was artificial in our eyes and tore apart families and communities who couldn't meet or unite for decades. My Palestinian identity developed as part of my political awakening. As a student at Hebrew University, I began putting together the pieces of the larger picture, the context in which we live in, the origins of the discrimination, the military regime my parents lived under from 1948 to 1966, the occupation my family members across the Green Line live under to this day. My Palestinian identity is first and foremost my connection to my people who lived in historic Palestine, but this identity comes with a price. A punishment for identifying with the enemy. In the words of member of Knesset Ayman Audi, the chair of the Arab Joint List, my country is at war with my people. Yes, my identity includes an Israeli component. When I first moved to Europe, people would try to guess where I'm from based on my accent. 
often they would guess Israel, and they were correct. Walking down the streets of Tel Aviv, I can easily blend in. But this aspect of my identity is always undermined, and I feel like I am forced to choose, Israeli or Palestinian. If I choose to identify as a Palestinian, I am immediately perceived as an outsider to the Israeli collective, out, ousted and delegitimized. If I choose to identify as an Israeli, this choice is always looked at with a magnifying glass, always conditioned by mainstream Jewish majority. Am I loyal enough? Have I condemned every single one of the Palestinian acts of violence? Do I stand while the national anthem is played? In other words, which parts of my Palestinian identity I'm willing to give up in order to be accepted as an Israeli? Because in the current reality, the two are mutually exclusive. I and my colleagues at Sikui do not accept these premises. Together, we work in a joint organization managed and run by Jews and Arabs to change these realities that have become a burden on my personal identity, our community, and a barrier to society in Israel. We work to advance civic equality for the Arab citizens of Israel, looking at two aspects. The first one is equal distribution of material resources focusing on the allocation of state budgets, provision of government services, and fair representation of Arabs in decision-making bodies. We identify the barriers that stand in the way of equality and make policy recommendations to remove those. We work with Arab local authorities and leadership to create bridges of collaboration with government, ministries, and change budgeting mechanisms with the goal of closing the gaps created by years of discrimination. The road is long and winding, but I'm pleased to report that this past December, on the very last day of 2015, the government had voted in favor of what is known as the Economic Plan for the Arab Sector, or its official name, Decision 922. In this groundbreaking decision, the government is working to change 15 budgeting mechanisms in a way which will ensure fair and even affirmative action budgeting to close the gaps in public transportation, in housing, and in planning, and more. The motivation behind this decision is the understanding that without closing these gaps, the Arab citizens of Israel can't integrate in the workforce, a reality that if it's continued, if it continued, will cause an economic crisis in the future. The other aspect of our work relates closer to the topic of this talk, shared society. Equality is not only a matter of equal access or equal distribution of material resources. It's not only an issue of the individual rights of members of the minority. It's also about the communal rights and the ability of both communities, Jewish and Arab, to live here together in this shared homeland. President Ridlin says that, that we, we were, were bound, bound to, to live here, here together. together. And I say, okay. if, if so, so we, we must build, build this shared, shared society, society as, as a place, place where, where both, both identities can, can dwell side by side safely. Where Arabic, my mother tongue, is present in the public sphere, my heritage and history are taught in schools, my culture and religion are acknowledged by narrative, my narrative is respected. Yes, even when this narrative conflicts or contradicts the narrative of the Jewish majority. Shared society where both communities feel at home, both communities feel they are the balea bait of the public space. And both expect, or sorry, both accept each other's ownership of our home. This is my work, but it's not for me and my Jewish and Arab partners only. 
your insight and partnership have a role in making this happen. Thank you. Thank you.